today is uh, the one year anniversary of honestly like the most shocking death that I've ever experienced. And that was you know Michael Brooks dying um, unexpectedly of um, you know, he had a, a blood clot, which is terrifying because this could happen to anyone, really. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that's sudden and doesn't have any, you know, symptoms ahead of time. And uh, I remember a year ago, Nando calling me after I had finished TYT's production meeting in the morning, and he told me, and I couldn't even, I didn't stay on the phone. Like he told me, and I just, I had to go immediately and like lost it. Um, I can't believe he's gone. Even even now, it's hard to process it. So we'll start with some substance. There's some funny stuff in here too. But the first video um, I also shared on Weekends, which is the show I host with Nando on Jacobin, um, and it has to do with uh, Michael Brooks's thoughts on U.S. imperialism. Let's watch. There's a countervailing tendency where you know if somebody's opposed to U.S. interests, we have to sanitize them, we can't have an intellectually rigorous conversation. I think that doesn't work because I actually mainly even just frankly for if you wanted to look at it in terms of propaganda purposes, I don't think that kind of bullshitting about everything works. Mm -hmm. um, and I would actually make a really hard and fast distinction, frankly, between um, the enormous complexity of something like China, which we just need to learn how to be adults about, um, which is gonna push back against uh, the new Cold War, fear-mongering, war-mongering attempt. Also combine the fact that that push against China is delusional. I mean, how are you going to, how much are you really going to bully a rising power where your entire supply chain relies on them? Mm -hmm. uh, and that it is very important to understand how China looks at the world, how they conduct their foreign policy. And then at the same time, I think it's ridiculous and foolhardy to make excuses um, of where China, you know, abuses rights or whatever else. I just, again, I just think it's silly. And also you have to look at the entirety of Asia. In the Middle East, um, you know, there's big variance here in terms of Iran, Syria, wherever else. But, uh, and again, abuses committed by these various governments and leaders like Assad. But the main story is pushing away U.S. interventionism, U.S. imperialism, which is extraordinarily aggressive in the Middle East. That nuance is, seems to be lost on most individuals who, who purport to be on the left and weigh in on foreign policy, international relations, anything having to do with American imperialism. Because mm -hmm. yes, it's true that American imperialism has been destructive, it's been awful, and we should fight against it. But to do that while simultaneously minimizing the crimes committed by dictatorial regimes is not anything I'm interested in. Because guess what, I come from a people who have dealt with genocide. And thanks to the disinformation peddlers of the early 1900s, the international community for a long time denied that they were victims of genocide. So for yep. me to sit here and whitewash the war crimes of other dictators, I think it's ridiculous. And I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna engage in it. The reason why I loved Michael is because he was able to hold these thoughts together, right? Without uh, you know, being accused of being pro-American uh, pro imperialism. Like he was just able to kind of like distill every situation in a way that was easy to understand, easy to digest and was just accurate. It was accurate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think in terms of that, like that clip right there, it is really interesting. And I, I can't, was he was saying that like, there are these crimes that are being committed by like the Chinese government that shouldn't go unnoticed by the left. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that's sort of what he was saying. And I think that's really right on. And for someone like him who was so, who was actually focused on internationalism, I mean, I think that American exceptionalism does happen on the left too, where we ascribe like superhuman powers to the American empire or the Democratic Party. And you peel back the curtain and you're like, oh, they're just a bunch of idiots, just doing idiot stuff, you know? Like, not everything goes back to this country. There is internationalism, there are people on the ground in China, in Syria, in Brazil, you know, like, yep. and, and we need to be smarter than what our governments do, which is equate Chinese people with their government, equate Iranian people with their government and go after them 
equate Cuban people with their government and go after them with sanctions and war. And we need to be stronger and smarter than that and say, look, no, it's about solidarity. And man, Michael knew that. Yep. You know, Michael was 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 into that. But like we we I feel like the left, you know, we had it in the 60s. There's sort of a resurgence in the 80s and Central American solidarity. But like we've definitely lost the international solidarity piece of how do we support workers and environmental activists and women's rights, not from a, a place of imperialism, not through our government, but like through social movements, through the internet, through, you know, through who we interview and such. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, he was very clear on Syria as well, very clear on it. Um, so I want to go to this next video. They're just so <laughs> triumphant. They're like, all the Republican emails I got were like, we did it. We go over this a lot. Uh, some people find it necessary. They can't just say, make all of the true statements, which is that US intervention in the beginning and generally besides preserving some protection with the Kurds is a very bad idea that we supported through the Gulf states, all these jihadist groups and, and horrible actors, that's all true. And Assad's a butcher who's vastly disproportionately sort of culpable for most of the violence there. Like this is all correct. And some people seem to feel that you need to have like some counter narrative fantasy about him in order to be anti-interventionist, which I just don't agree with. But I think the other uh, the other really important thing coming out of this, though, is that even if you look at somebody like Patrick Coburn, who I, you know, I might not always see this. He probably looks at it a little bit more from the kind of Assad lens that I do, but he's there and he's an incredibly good reporter. And, you know, he's basically saying like, and I don't know if this is possible, but like, yeah, Assad's going to say, but he needs to release political prisoners and they need to stop engaging in violence and the Kurds need to have some protection. Like there, and the refugees, much more needs to be done for refugees. There's actually in terms of substance, I think what's funny is I think there is actually a left position. It's just that everybody's fighting on all these relative margins oh, and conspiracy like, it's become, theories it's versus become, like, it's become a stand in and a proxy for other arguments. Yeah, it's simple, simple, clear, nuanced. And there's a reason why certain people uh, wouldn't attack him, you know, for saying what he said in that video. And which, by the mm -hmm. way, he had similar comments in several videos on Syria. Uh, but I do find it fascinating that like no one dared to treat him the way that I've been treated uh, lately as a result of basically saying the same thing about Assad, right? Like it's anyway, but that's whatever, beside the point. What I loved about him was just his honesty and how right he was, right? Like yeah. he was well read, he was intellectually curious, but more importantly, like, he had a guiding principle that informed all of his commentary. And that's why he's consistent throughout all of his content. Because he, there was never any, you know, pandering to what's popular at the moment. There was never any BS like that. He was just very clear in, in, in his beliefs, in what needed to get done. He cared about strategy. More importantly, he cared about winning. And that's why mm. he did call out people like Jimmy Dore in his content because he saw them as an obstacle to winning. And to be sure, we're experiencing those obstacles right now. Oh um, my God. Yeah. Counter, counter narrative fantasy. That line, that phrase of like being so far left that you wrap yourself in a counter, like a counter narrative fantasy. I love that. Like that. Yeah, you excuse everything and we see that, right? Like that you put, people put ideology before fact. And honestly, it's something I appreciate about you, Anna, cause you, God, you dive through and read so much news every day. And if there's a, a twist in the story, you're gonna name it. If there's a, if, if the sot continues and people need to know the context, you're not gonna Tucker Carlson it. You're gonna name the, even if it doesn't support your ideology. Mm -hmm. Because actually it brings up more questions and that's a great conversation. And then people get convinced and then people learn. Like it behooves progressives to be curious, to ask those questions and to be able to save two things at once. Walk and chew gum, baby. Like we forgot that. God, we forgot how to do that. I know, I know, it's so depressing. Um, and I'm gonna go to the final video because we're running out of time. Uh, but you know, 
A lot of people, and Ben Burgess was talking about this during his tribute to Michael, and it was, his tribute was wonderful. Everyone go check out, give them an argument. Um, I, I love the videos that he chose to share featuring Michael, and I also love the you know tribute that he gave personally. And he talked about how, you know, after Michael's death, a lot of people are like making it almost seem like he was this perfect, unflawed person who never like did anything wrong and never like mm -hmm. he's he was human, like he was flawed in other ways, right? And I don't I don't want to get into his flaws, but one thing that like has been standing out to me is people seem to think that like he was always above any drama or dunking on people. One of the things I loved doing on his show was dunking on Dave Rubin. We did a lot of that. Um, <laughs> But he he also again like he would he would be measured and he'd be careful in how he would go after it, people who identified as part of the left. Mm -hmm. But when he would do it, there was always a purpose for it, right? And he did do this quite a bit with Jimmy Dore. And I think that this mashup video, this is part of like a longer 11 minute long video, which you guys can all watch on YouTube if you want. But someone did a mashup of his response to a caller about Jimmy Dore. And I think that what he says here is exactly what I wish I did a better job in communicating, but what I think he did a great job in communicating. So let's watch. Look, the the beef with Jimmy Dore. I'm not trying to create Hillary comms director tweeted something or some bull and you're vote shaming. That's a big phrase they like. Well, that's exactly what you're doing. Look, the the beef with Jimmy Dore. I'm not trying to create broad reactive populism. I'm trying to create a left path to saving democracy and generating some type of what we call socialism, which means different things to different people. But that's an actual thing. And a major part of that thing is building alliances across lines that include not unnecessarily alienating people who, as an example, might support Andrew Gillum. And I know we have a reputation as being the most smug and arrogant show on YouTube, which is awesome and hilarious to me. And I'm definitely funnier. But the endless whataboutism, the endless false equivalencies, the endless moralism, and the endless just focus on electoralism is, is both and it's substantively wrong. It's miseducating people about how to think about politics. They have nothing to do with how much you curse, how much you hate, you know, Neera Tandon or Hillary Clinton. Nothing to do with whether or not you want to be wonky or not. I think Jimmy is a funny, entertaining, and interpersonally, in my experience, nice guy. But for all of the substantive reasons, those are problems in how you're doing politics. And it also includes recognizing that in today's world, the primary threat is the fascist running it, not something that John Edwards said in 2009 that you can make a clip about to do a false equivalency. That's bull****. It's wrong. Then you have to admit that he's a Fox News on the left. No, and I don't. Fox News no, works. he's not. Fox News helps win. Fox News has a strategy. Fox News is relentless. Do you think Fox News would do over 70% of their clip on how he's not a real conservative and he's a sellout? He's not Fox News on the left at all. If you mean stylistically, maybe so. And I keep telling you, that's the part I, I mean, like I mean, and have no problem I mean, with. I will match my support for Bernie Sanders in that primary against anybody's. And I never was in a position of saying that people who voted the other way from me that were normal, everyday people were stupid or wrong or whatever. I actually said we need to do a better job to win because that's actually what the job of politics is. Simple. I mean, I mean he was just so clear on everything. So uh, the attacks on people were due to an important purpose, right? Um, and again, like we're seeing the toxicity manifest online right now as we speak. And I, look, I don't know how intentional it is, Francesca. I don't know if the intention is to divide the left. What I do know is that the behavior of the very person who was being talked about in that clip is dividing the left. And oh yeah, it makes. I mean, that's his bread and butter. That's how he makes his money. And when people get mad at me for calling him a bad faith actor, you can get ahead. Go ahead and get mad. But I had the um, distinct pleasure of working with that guy. 
and understanding that there was no guiding principle, there was no ideology, there was cruelty to others behind the scenes, and honestly now, just transparent cruelty to people on the scene. <laughs> like yeah, bragging on, about it. Yeah, yeah, bragging about it. So that's who he is. That's who he is. And I, I, the thing that I loved was that Michael had the balls. He had the courage to call it out. Whereas right now yeah. you have a bunch of people, you know, caving to the bullying of of clowns like freaking Jimmy Dore, and it's it's really embarrassing. It is. The focus on winning. I just want to double down on that that that. Jimmy and other people like him and leftists who are haggling and getting clout off of tearing each other down, that is not winning. Mm -hmm. And that people who are actually doing the work, people who are do, are campaigning, people who've put their bodies literally on the line, that's winning. You know, so so it is important to remember that and you know, keep your eye on the prize and and don't don't get, you know, distracted. I have to show my cat now. This is for Michael. Aww. This is for Michael. This is Aww. This is for everybody. Everyone needs a good squeeze and a hug and some love. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that. All you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.